Okay, we're fine. So uh, last class, we I sort of rushed at the end the discussion on lock granularities. So I want to go through that again because I think this is kind of important because this is this is you know, going beyond what normal two-phase locking sort of covers. Like you have to cover understand how we're going to do this uh, when you may want to do locking not just on individual tuples. Right. So last time we said that uh, in all of the examples I gave before. Uh, under two-phase locking, we said the lock was essentially on an object, and in, in actuality, you usually envision this as being on a tuple. But in some systems, you actually can have a lock hierarchy, where you can, you can have these different elements of the database all have in, uh, individual locks that you can acquire on them, right? So you can have a database, and database has tables, and database has tuples, and tuples have attributes. So the way to sort of think about this hierarchy is that if our transaction comes along, and it locks the table, that implicitly locks everything below it in the hierarchy. And the idea here is that instead, if we want to do a very large update to our, to our database or our table, maybe instead of getting a lock on an individual tuple, we've got a lock on the table or a page, and that'll cover a, a larger segment with fewer in invocations of the lock manager. So the example, we, the first example we shared before was two transactions. Where the first one you want to get the balance of my bank account. The second one you want to increase the balance of Joy's bank account. And the, our question is, what, what kind of lock should, should they obtain? And what we talked about was that we introduced a new class of locks, new types of locks called intention locks, that allow us to provide hints to other transactions or threads that are running in our, in our database system at the same time. In our lock hierarchy, be able to say that there's something going on more explicitly down below, but you can figure out what that is, you know, essentially what that is at a high level in the upper regions of, of the hierarchy. Right? And the three classes of intention locks were going to be uh, uh, shared intention, exclusive intention, and shared intention exclusive. So again, an intention lock essentially is at a high level. It tells you what's going on below it without having to traverse down and look at everything below you. Right? Intention share basically says that down below, There'll be a shared lock. Uh, intention exclusive says down below, there'll be an exclusive lock. And then shared attention exclusive will lock w whatever node in the higher level that you're at in, under shared mode. But then it gives a hint that says down below, there's, there are exclusive, exclusive locks. And the compatibility matrix was like this. Essentially, the intention shared is compatible with almost everything except for exclusive locks. And then as you go down, they become uh, less compatible um, and you may not be able to intermix them at the higher levels. Right? Again, the high level the way to think about this is at the, at the top levels, you take intention locks or, or, or the explicit locks, the shared or exclusive, but then at the leaf nodes, you have to either take shared or exclusive. Right? So we use our example or these two transactions. T1 wants to read my bank account record from R. Um, and it's just going to read this one tuple. So at the table, table level in the hierarchy, it gets an intention shared lock because it wants to say, down below, I'm going to take a share lock at a tuple. Um, and then and when I find my tuple, then I take the explicit share lock. And then the uh, uh, transaction two that wants to update this tuple over here, it can take a intention exclusive lock at the table, which is compatible with the intention shared lock. Um, and then down below, it takes, it takes the exclusive lock on it. Right? So if we do a more complicated example with three transactions. So we'll have the first transaction wants to scan R and update a few of the tuples. Transaction two wants to read a single tuple out of R. And transaction three wants to scan all the tuples at R as well. So the uh, first guy will, will do a scan on R. So it wants to read all these tuples and update the last one. So it can take a shared intention exclusive lock. So that implicitly now says all the locks below, or all the tuples, are now locked in shared mode, as well as the table essentially being locked in shared mode. And then it can take the exclusive lock on just the one the one tuple that it needs to modify. So now, again, the second transaction wants to read a single tuple, and it wants to read this one over here. It can land on this, on, on, in the table, take an intention shared lock, which is compatible with the shared intention exclusive lock, and then go down below and get the shared lock that it needs. And then the last guy wants to do, scan all the tuples, so we want to do a, uh, we want to get a, we need a shared lock for all of these guys. So you could go down below, and just take share locks as you go along, but it'll end up being when you get to the last one, you won't be able to get it because the other transaction has the exclusive lock on it. But because we try to put a share lock on the table, this will actually will get blocked or denied 
because a transaction holds a shared intention exclusive lock. And therefore, we don't even need to go check and try to acquire the locks for everything at the bottom because we'll get blocked right away. Yes? Uh, can you explain one more time for T1 why he needs a shared intention exclusive lock instead of a intention exclusive lock? All right, so transaction one was uh, scan a few tuples and update them, right? So your question is, why is he getting a shared intention exclusive rather than, than intention exclusive? Right, so we're going to scan all the tuples, right? We want to read all of them. So if he did a shared intention exclusive, um, sorry, if you did a intention exclusive, right, that would mean that these guys would not be in under on our shared locks, right? Then you have to go down and take explicit share locks on each of, each of them. What? By saying shared intention exclusive, the shared part, the you know the first part, the S, that now means that the table is in shared lock, and implicitly now all the tuples are under that shared lock. So I only have to acquire one I, to, to to lock all of them. I only have to acquire one lock the shared lock on the table at the top. But since I'm also going to do an update, then I also want to get an exclusive lock. So I'm, I'm need intention exclusive there anyway. So, Matt, so you could acquire a shared lock on R and then try to get an intention exclusive lock on R. But now that's two calls into the lock manager. And the lock manager has to be, would have to be smart and say, well, I know you're the same transaction, so maybe I'll convert you now or I'll try to figure out how to uh, upgrade your, your lock so that you can have this intermixing. Whereas now it's one lock request. I get everything locked in shared mode, and then the last guy, I get my attention lock. Right? And again, anybody else that comes along would know by just looking at the table lock what's going on below, or at least have an idea what's going on below. Well, this also works uh, for the last week. Because it's, it's like you don't, when you insert or delete, you don't, you don't know when you first start to delete, you don't know whether there will be a lock. So his question is, will this work with B plus trees? Hold that thought, we'll cover that later. The answer is no. Right? In B plus trees, as we'll see, you don't actually have intention locks. You don't, you don't need them. Okay. Right, so this last guy wants to get a shared lock because he wants to scan the, all the tuples. Right? That's the minimum number of locks you need to scan, right? scan everything, just the one shared lock on the table. But that'll get blocked because it's incompatible with the shared intention exclusive lock. Right? So again, in practice, what we want to do is we want to minimize the number of locks that a transaction has to take, right? Because that could potentially increase uh, parallelism and it's f fewer invocations into the lock manager table. Um, and these intention locks are essentially the hints we're going to use to figure out uh, where, when we're allowed to do things. And the protocol for acquiring these locks is essentially always going to be top down. So you go down the hierarchy and acquire the proper locks you need at the different levels of, of the system. Now, in the, my earlier example I showed, you could have a database, you could have a table lock. I, I didn't show, but you could also have a page lock. Um, and then the bottom, you could have a tuple lock or attribute lock. In practice, uh, it's usually you don't have locks on individual attributes, because that's too fine grain and it's too uh, heavyweight to, to maintain. Typically, you have page locks. Uh, so you typically have, you have database locks, table locks, and tuple locks. Uh, maybe some of the commercial systems you can also acquire page locks, but um, that, I, I, that I don't know anybody that actually does that. Right? And then we also sort of mentioned this before, is that uh, we can use lock escalation to upgrade what the lock type we have is. Uh, we always have to go in one direction. So if we have a shared lock and we want to say now we want an exclusive lock on an object, we're allowed to do that. We can't, we can't go in, in the other direction, right? All right, so the last class we spent all this time talking about these different locks and two-phase locking. And in all the example schedules that I showed you, I showed you where you know, we had the reads and writes, but then we had the lock and unlock commands. In practice, you as the application programmer don't actually write lock and unlock commands. You can do it, and I'll show you how to do it in the next slide. But the way to think about, again, two-phase locking is that the application programmer doesn't need to know anything about concurrency control, right? It doesn't need to know anything about isolation or, or things like that, right? They, or they just want to assume that their transaction is the only transaction running at the time of the system, so they don't want to, they don't want to worry about reading and writing 
data from, from other transactions that are maybe may going on at the same time. Right, that's sort of what the serializable uh, guarantee provides for us. Uh, but it may be the case where the, the database system needs a bit more information to know actually what, what, it, what you want to do. Yes? So, so your question is, if, 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 your, if your lock hierarchy includes the database at the top, do you have to acquire a lock for that? Yes. yes. So you have to acquire, like, th so the way this multi-granularity hierarchy works is you have to acquire locks that, at every level going on the way down. This one? No, no, no. Previous, uh, say, say when. Uh, uh, the compatibility matrix or the, the hierarchy? Uh, yes. OK. Oh, sorry. Yeah, so, that, so his question is, why, why didn't I take the database lock? Yeah, it was just trying to illustrate this. Yes, I should have started at the database. Correct, yes. Um, OK. Right, and again, sort of the reason why we always have to go from the top down is because of deadlocks, right? If we go top down, someone goes top up, then we might be trying to wait for each other's locks, right? By enforcing that hierarchy, enforcing that direction uh, in the same way that we did with deadlock prevention, wait or die, wound to wait, we ensure that there's, there could be no deadlocks. Okay. All right, so again, the, the major thing I want you to point out is like the way in practice you would use two-phase locking as an application programmer is that you actually don't know about it, right? You're not going to call a lock explicitly. The database system is going to do this for you, right? And this is part of the reason why usually there isn't, you know, most database systems that implement two-phase locking do strict two-phase locking because there's no way typically for you as the application programmer through SQL to say, all right, I want to release this lock, right? It just, so it, just, it releases them all when you, when you commit. So in the SQL standard, actually, you can... Uh, actually, this may or may not be in SQL standard. Uh, yeah, it is not. Right. So there are ways to explicitly lock an entire table. Um, so in Oracle, Postgres, and DB2, it's the command is lock table in, in particular mode, and then your table is share exclusive. Actually, one of the things I like about Oracle and Postgres in some ways, and to a lesser extent DB2, is a lot of the terminology that's used in the textbook not just our textbook and other textbooks, like, you know, shared and exclusive, you know, the, the, the syntax in SQL in Postgres actually matches up quite nicely with this, right? When, whereas in, in MySQL, the modes are read and write, right? So you can lock entire table uh, and, and in this way. In SQL Server, they have this sort of extra syntax where you say with a table lock and then what mode you're in. Um, it has to be part of a SQL query. And then in, uh, in, in MySQL, you can say just lock the entire table. Right? And typically, you would do this for things like uh, if I need to do a bulk update, right? I want to prevent anybody from modifying you know, the entire table while I do something, so you, you, you'll lock the entire thing. And actually, implicitly also, too, uh, when you do like an alter table to maybe modify the schema to add or drop a column, the, the database system will take the entire lock for you, entire lock on the table as well while it, while it does this, at least in, uh, in some systems. Some systems can be a bit smart about it. All right. Another cool thing you can do in SQL is provide a hint to the database system to say that I'm reading this tuple now, uh, but I'm probably going to update it or later on or modify it later on. So rather than taking a shared lock when you actually read the tuple, you can tell the database system, go ahead and actually take the exclusive lock now. Right? So basically the syntax is you say select star from table, and then we have your where clause, and then you add this for update at the end. Right, without this for update, under two-phase locking, when you read this, the database system takes a shared lock for you. Uh, but if you say for update, then it, it, it'll try to do an exclusive lock. OK? All right, so that's pretty much a fit for two-phase locking. Uh, I will say that it's in use in almost every single database management system. Even ones that they say they're using multi-version concurrency control, they're actually using uh, two-phase locking as the actual the scheduling protocol, the, the, the thing that actually figures out how to interleave operations in the context of a multi-versioning system, which we'll cover uh, in two or three lectures from now. And again, the way to think about this two-phase locking compared to what we talked about at the very beginning when we talked about serializability is that this is a dynamic protocol that doesn't know what transactions are going to do ahead of time. 
it, it sees a transaction start and sees a bunch of queries show up, and it figures out whether you're allowed to read or write certain things based on what you want to do and what locks you need to acquire and what other transactions hold those locks, right? And by itself, two-phase locking can guarantee uh, complex serializable schedules, but is it still susceptible to cascading aborts? So if you use strict two-phase locking, then you can get complex serializable schedules without uh, cascading aborts. Okay? So any questions about two-phase locking? Okay, awesome. So now let's switch over to do uh, the next lecture, which is index concurrency control. So the, in this class, in this particular lecture, we're going to actually talk about two things. So we're going to talk about uh, how indexes affect what we have to do in concurrency control, um, in, in, so related to like two-phase locking or timestamp ordering concurrency control. But then we're also going to answer the question he had of, how do you make a concurrent B plus tree? Right? Do you want to use two-phase locking or, or, or another locking protocol? Okay? And so the, the, that second part of how do you actually build a concurrent B plus tree is what the third project, one, one of the components of the third project. All right, so when we talked about transactions in the, in the first concurrent lecture and in, under two-phase locking, we made this big assumption that our, our, our database was static. That meaning that the number of objects we had in our database was fixed. We didn't have any inserts, we didn't have updates, we didn't have any deletes. But now if we introduce those operations, we start to hit other problems. That two-phase locking by itself is not going to be able to solve for us. So now this example here, uh, rather than having low level reads and writes, I want to show actual SQL statements. So the first transaction is going to read our people table and it wants to find the maximum age of a person that has their status set to lit. And then our other transaction will come along and it will insert into the people table somebody with age 96 and their status to lit. And then we're going to execute that same query that we had before um, where we get our max age. So now the issue is that when the first transaction runs the first query the first time, it gets the value 72. Right? But then somebody goes ahead and inserts into the people table, age 96. So now when we execute this query again, we get 96. Right? So this is obviously wrong, right? Under, under what we said before about serializable schedules, if we were executing these transactions in serial order, the, the second guy shouldn't be able to see 96 because they saw 72 before. Right? So assuming we, we did two-phase locking, uh, this, you know, this, this would actually still happen, right? And it's sort of obvious why, right? Because when we ran the query the first time, if we take shared locks on all the individual tuples we, in order to read them, when that next guy comes along and inserts, a transact, inserts that tuple, uh, it was able to insert an entry that couldn't have been locked because it didn't exist before, right? So conflict serializable will guarantee that, in, in, in our two-phase locking, will guarantee that we can, get, we can achieve serializable schedules uh, only if the number of objects in the database is fixed. And when we solve this problem next class, I mean, actually, I mean this class right now, right? So this is, this is the issue we've got to deal with, right? And part of the, the problem we're, we're you know, possibly dealing with here is that, again, the Ignoring the lock granularity stuff, right? If I only lock the individual tuples, then the first transaction can't lock a tuple that actually exists, right? So the way we're going to solve this is actually relying on our indexes that we could possibly have to lock things that we, we haven't gotten yet. And so there's, there's a couple approaches to do, and I'm going to highlight at a high level two of them. Uh, this is actually, we could spend hours discussing this, and so I'll, I'll cover this in the advanced class, but I just want to give you a high level what actual real systems do, um, and how you actually implement them is, is quite difficult, and we'll, again, we'll focus, that on, focus on that in the next semester. So the actual first idea uh, to solve this problem, I'll say, I'll say too, this is called the phantom problem, right? This is another anomaly like uh, dirty reads or unrepeatable reads, right? The, the, or, or loss updates, the phantom basically means that there was a tuple there before, 
and I read it, and I come back, and now it's gone, or there wasn't a tuple there, and now I come back, and it and actually it appears. And it, it can affect things like, like aggregates. So the, the, the actual original idea from the IBM guys in the 1970s to solve this phantom problem was called predicate locking. And the basic way to think about this is that for any possible predicate you could have on your, on your, on your table, uh, you would sort of maintain this multi-dimensional data structure that could figure out whether the thing you're trying to, you know, another query would, would overlap with a predicate from another query, right? So in my first query, in that first transaction, I did my, my aggregation, and I said where status equals lit. So rather than ha trying to lock all the individual tuples that satisfy that predicate, I could have this virtual lock that says for any possible tuple with this, with this predicate, I now hold a lock for it. So now when the second guy came along and tried to insert that, that record that satisfied that predicate, then you would hit the collision or hit the lock conflict, and it wouldn't allow to be do, do the insert, right? So this is what the IBM guys actually proposed in the 1970s when they first sort of said, oh, here's this phantom problem, here's, you know, that, that, that can occur under two-phase locking, and here's a potential solution to it. Uh, they didn't actually implement it, as far as I know, because it's actually quite difficult to do, right? Where, it, you know, in my simple example here, where status equals lit, it's one thing, we, you know, we, we could just easily check that. But now think about if you have a where clause with a bunch of conjunctions or disjunctions, right? Now you have all these, these, uh, these different, different, um, uh, multi-dimensional spaces, you need to see whether there's an intersection, uh, and that would be really difficult to maintain. Um, so in practice, nobody actually does predicate locking, even though it seems like the, the obvious solution. Now there was a, a proposal called precision locking that's sort of a rough approximation of this that came out in the 1980s, and as far as I know, there's only one database system that does that, and that's Hyper out of uh, Germany, and we'll cover that in the advanced class, right? So what we're going to want to need now is since we can't have these sort of arbitrary predicate locks, we're actually going to rely on indexes to approximate uh, this kind of locking. And the, the hope is that we can rely on our indexes since they're already a data structure that knows about ranges and knows about, about values on particular attributes. We can rely on that to, to help us uh, do, do our locking efficiently. Right? So assume that you have an index uh, on the status field. And what we can do is that we can find all of the pages in our index that correspond to where status equals lit. And then we can take a lock on those pages. And now we know that if anybody tries to insert a new tuple with status equals lit, they will try to go to one of our pages that we have locked. And that essentially does, prevents them from being able to do that. Right? The tricky thing, of course, is that if you don't have a, any records with status equals lit, then you need to have sort of a virtual page or some kind of marker to say, all right, here's where a page would exist if they had the status equals lit. Let me go ahead and lock that. And then that way, if anybody comes along and tries to insert a tuple, the index will figure out, well, this is where you would go if you did exist, and somebody else already holds the lock for that. Yes? have an index built on the, the attribute, so, so it doesn't solve this problem in general. He's absolutely right. So his, so his statement is, this doesn't work unless you have an index built on the thing that you, you're, it's in your where clause that you, you want, want to lock. You're absolutely correct, yes. Right, so um, in a OLTP setting, right, in an OLTP setting you want to avoid all sequential scans so anything you're going you're to do a lookup on, you're probably going to have an index. So otherwise, you're just scanning the entire database, and you, all your transactions are going to run super slow, right? So then now if you say, all right, well, I don't have an index, and, uh, and I'm OK with sequential scans, well, you're probably in an OLAP environment where you're not trying to insert and update things all the time, and you probably wouldn't hit a, uh, the phantom problem. And actually, nor would you actually probably even care, right? If I, if I read one, you know, if I'm not trying to make critical decisions about you know, the, 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 the max age of somebody when I want to do analytics, I don't care if it goes from 72 to 96. But in an OLTP environment where you're trying to use your operational database to change things on the fly, make other decisions, maybe you do care about strong, strong serializability. So you would have an index, right? 
Yes. But even if you didn't have an index, what's the like, best solution? Like, assuming that you were given, you had to do this, like, insert or update, would it be just a like, create index on the fly? So his question is, if you don't have an index, what, could you just create one on the fly? Uh, no, right? Because building an index is not cheap. Your, your table is huge, right? It would take a long time, right? Yeah, yeah. Does this not work for like a store? His question is, would this not work on a column store? Why would it not work on a column store? Uh, so his, his, his question is, um, his question is, if I lock, if I want to lock an index page, right, we're talking about indexes, not the actual data itself, right? So if you have an index, you lock the index page, it doesn't matter whether it's a row store or it's a column store, right? Um, again, the, and so in this example, we're trying to use the index as the, as, the, as the sort of central lock location for us to be able to figure out whether someone's going to insert something or update something that may interfere with, with, our, with our transactions, right? So, so related to, to his question earlier is like, what can you do if you don't have an index? Um, and essentially what you can do is you could take a lock on every page, uh, which would be kind of wasteful, right, just to make sure that nobody else ever actually changes anything, right? In addition to inserts, we also have to worry about someone having an existing status, we go ahead and change them to lit, and then we would ha have another problem. Right, so we lock every page that does this. Uh, we also can lock the entire table. It's essentially the same thing as locking every page. Um, but again, that, that's sort of wasteful. Uh, there are other, uh, other methods to do this without an index. Precision locks, or the predicate locking was one example. Um, there also is sort of graph data structures. You can figure out whether there's conflicts between other transactions. Um, Postgres actually does that, but that's a bit advanced. We're not going to cover that here. In practice, most of the times when, trans when database systems say they support serial serializable transactions, and they truly support serializable transactions, then they're going to do some variant of index locking that I'm showing here. And the reason why I'm saying uh, they say they're serializable and they truly are serializable, because subsystems like Oracle is, is notorious for this. If you say you want serializable transactions in Oracle, it'll come back and say, yes, you're now serializable. But in practice, it's actually a lower level. Um, and again, we'll, we'll talk about this later on. But in, in a lot of applications, that doesn't matter. That doesn't care. And that's, that's a good trade-off from a system development standpoint. The alternative to doing locking, either with index or without indexes that, that I mentioned, is essentially just do what's called repeating your scans. So for, for point queries, it's, it's, it's essentially easy, right? Because if I update something, I'll hold exclusive lock on it, so I don't have to worry about somebody else updating it for me, right? The, the issue we're trying to deal with really here is if I, if I do a range scan and someone inserts something into my range that I didn't see the first time I came through, right? So, one approach to get around this is that you just keep track of the tuples you read for every single scan your transaction does. And then when the transaction goes and commits, you go back and run that scan again and see whether you get the same result. And if you get the same result, then you know there weren't any phantoms and you can go ahead and commit the transaction. Right? So it seems kind of wasteful, but actually this idea of repeating your queries uh, just to see whether it matches up with what you did the first time, it does show up in, a, in, a, in other cases. Uh, as far as I know, I don't think any commercial system actually does this approach. Uh, the, only system, uh, the only other major system that I know about is this thing called Silo, which came out of Harvard uh, and MIT a few years ago, and it's, it's an in-memory database engine. And they support serializable transactions by just, again, just rerunning your scans, when you go to validate it, the transaction, and if, you match, match that, if your scan set matches, then you know you're serializable and you go ahead and commit. If it doesn't match, you abort and, and try the transaction again. Right? So the next thing to sort of address is the, I mean, sort of been alluding to this all the last couple of lectures, and I, don't, I never know when the right time it is to actually teach you about, you guys about lower isolation levels, because you kind of need to know what it means to have serializable isolation before I can tell you what the lower isolation levels are. And to understand, understand serializable uh, isolation, you have to understand, you know, uh, conflict serializability, two-phase locking, and phantoms, and all the other anomalies. Um, so the, I've, been, I've been referred to this a couple of times, um, that 
serializable is really nice, and from an academic standpoint, it seems like the gold standard of what you would want. Right? Yeah, your transactions are going to run as if they're in isolation uh, or isolated from each other, even though we may interleave their operations in different ways. Um, but in practice, most database systems actually don't, don't enforce this. Right? They run what is called a, at a lower isolation level. Um, and the reason is because the performance overhead of doing all the things you need to do to ensure that your trans transactions run at serializable isolation uh, is, is expensive. Right? And it's actually difficult to program, right? It's difficult to implement, and it's difficult to get this, you know, have this actually run efficiently. And this is part of the reason why, again, the NoSQL guys, when they first came out, you know, almost, you know, eight or nine years ago, a lot of them didn't do transactions at all in the beginning, let alone any serializable transactions, because implementing concurrent control correctly is actually, is actually really hard. And then there's cases where they come out with transactions, and some, it often comes out wrong. Right? When Cassandra introduced lightweight transactions a few years ago, someone immediately found a bug in it. Right? And there was another example of a system called Aerospike, where they claimed they had strong consistency in transactions, and then this, this guy in San Francisco came up with this bench, benchmark that actually proved that they weren't. And they had to go change all their marketing literature. Right? So serializable, again, from an academic standpoint, seems like the ideal case, but in practice, most transactions, most applications want to run at what's called a lower isolation level. And the way to think about isolation level is that you're telling the database management system to what extent the transaction that you're going to run is allowed to be exposed to the other operations of transactions running at the same time. Right? And so the things we talked about before, the dirty reads, the unrepeatable reads, and the phantom reads, right, these anomalies uh, if you want to avoid all of these and have true serializable isolation, then the database system has to do a bunch of all the stuff we talked about so far and enforce them and make sure that your transaction is safe from, o from other transactions. Um, but that can be, that limits the amount of parallelism and the amount of concurrency you have in the system and can slow you down. Right? So again, the way to think about this is that for these anomalies, these problems, when you run at lower isolation levels, you're not guaranteed to be, to be, to incur these or, or hit these problems. The database system is basically saying, I'm not going to do anything extra to prevent you from actually, from actually not having these problems. Right? So in the ANSI standard from, from SQL 92, they specify the following four isolation levels. Now, there's actually way more, uh, or a handful more, that we're not going to cover here. But these are the main ones you have to understand. And again, they fit nicely with the, well, what we talked about so far. So at the very top was serializable isolation. And again, remember I said that in practice, this is always going to be conflict serializable because most data systems aren't going to be able to implement view serializable. So if you run at serializable isolation, you have no phantoms, all your reads will be repeatable, and you have no dirty reads. But then below that, you have repeatable reads where phantoms may occur, right? Because you're not going to do the index locking that we talked about. Below that, you have read committed where the phantoms may occur and un unrepeatables actually may happen as well. And at the very bottom, you have read uncommitted where all of these different anomalies can happen. And as I said, just because that you tell the data system you actually want serializable doesn't actually mean it's going to actually truly implement that. Uh, and the same case for uh, sort of the one at the bottom. If you say you want read uncommitted, I think maybe in Postgres, uh, you actually can't get that because the way Postgres does concurrency control, it would actually be more work for them to make you do read, read uncommitted uh, versus running at the higher isolation level that they normally support. So in some cases, they, some systems don't support the extra things you need to get to be serializable. In some cases, they don't support the extra things you would need uh, to get to the lowest level. Right? And again, the, the way to sort of think about this in, in this table is that uh, the, the different anomalies at the highest level can, the data system will guarantee, or at least it's supposed to guarantee, sometimes there's bugs, will guarantee that you cannot have these problems at all. But then as you go below, we, the reason we say maybe instead of yes is because it depends on what other transactions are running at the same time and whether you're actually going to be exposed to them or not. And it's just saying the data system is not going to make sure that, 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 that they don't happen. So the way you actually implement this in the context of two-phase locking is that under serializable isolation, you're going to do all, you're essentially going to do strict two-phase locking. You're going to acquire all the locks that transactions need ahead of time. Uh, and then you plus you do the index locking that I talked about before, 
right? You lock the pages of the indexes that have that match the where clauses of the things you're doing lookup on. And then if you go down to repeatable reads, you get you get basically all everything from serializable, except they don't do index locks. Uh, under recommitted, what happens is that you get it's two phase locking, but shared locks are uh, released immediately. And at the very bottom, you basically have take no locks on anything. You can read anything you want. And we can do this in MySQL in Postgres. I think we tried last time, and we, and we couldn't get it to actually do it. So the way you use this, this in SQL is that you can set this, use this command called set transaction isolation level. And then for the isolation level part, you put in one of the, uh, you put one of the four types that, that I said before. Right? And not all database systems are actually going to be able to support all these different isolation levels under different scenarios. Right? This can occur, uh, again, if, if the data system doesn't support the, the upper and lower isolation levels, it just, just won't provide them. Um, it won't throw an error. Usually it says, yeah, you go ahead and, you know, if you say you want read uncommitted, it'll say, yeah, I got it. But you may actually be at a, at a higher level. And you have to actually read them in order to figure out what it actually means. Um, and then the, the default actually depends on what database management system you're using. Right? The, the SQL standard doesn't say anything. It just says, here's what, here's what you can provide, and it's up for the, the vendor to, to specify what they want to use. So this is a great table from 2013 that Peter Bayless came up with. He's a professor now at Stanford. Um, and it was a sort of a, a survey of a bunch of different database systems that were out at the time. Um, and he lists what the default isolation level is and what the maximum isolation level that they can support. And so the first thing to point out is only VoltDB and Ingress support serializable by default. Um, again, VoltDB was the system I helped build when I was in grad school. We built the system HDOR, and they and became uh, VoltDB later on. And I'm not going to talk about how VoltDB works, but essentially all your transactions run as store procedures at, on a single thread by themselves at a partition, so you know other transactions could be running at the same time, so you can't have any of these anomalies, so by default it's serializable. And then Ingress was the, the, the first database management system that one of my advisors, Mike Stonebreaker, built in the 1970s. It's still around today. And actually, I learned a few weeks ago, it's actually open source. Uh, it's a weird open source, and you have to sign up to get access to it, but it's open source. I haven't poked around and looked at it to see what it actually does. Um, but if anyone wants to try this out for the, for the um, the extra credit. I think it'd be very interesting to see what the original database system for the 1970s can do with the, you know, the, the current one. It's obviously not the same code, right? But it'd be interesting to see how much how, mu how much it's 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 matured or aged over the years. Um, but right, so the, the main thing to point out though is most of these times you see that the uh, that the the default isolation level for most of these systems are, are read committed. And actually, we've done a survey of database administrators earlier this year, and we found that. Uh, we asked them, what, you know, what isolation level do most of your transactions run in? Most of the times, it's read committed, and that's we we can't we can't prove this, but we think it's because it's just the default, right? And it's, and it's good enough for mo most things. Uh, I think Facebook most famously runs their entire MySQL cluster with read committed, and for for their environment, that's, that's perfectly fine. And the other thing to point out too is, on the maximum level, some of these guys can be serializable, uh, but some of them aren't. And the only other weird one here is Oracle has something called what's called snapshot isolation. Again, we're not going to cover that in this class. So maybe I'll cover it when, on, on their multi-versioning. Um, but this is actually a really interesting one because it's not in the four things that I listed before. It's actually this other isolation level that can occur, that can have a different type of anomaly that, uh, that is not covered by the ANSI standard that, that I'm described here. So again, when you say you want serializable isolation on Oracle, you actually really get snapshot isolation. And for, for a lot of applications, that's good enough. So another thing you can do also for the data system is provide a hint, is that you can tell it whether your transaction is actually going to read be read only or not. Right? So when your transaction starts, you can set the, the access mode using that SQL command, and you can tell it whether you want to be read write or read only. And so the reason why you may actually want to use this, because if you're read-only, then there are some optimizations that the data system can apply where it doesn't have to worry about other transactions checking to see whether you wrote anything. Right? You can maybe take a snapshot of the database and just and run with that. And as long as that's consistent, you're fine. Um, so I think, I know in, in early ver later versions of MySQL and Postgres and all the commercial systems, you, you can do this. Uh, 
but not all the data systems are going to actually take that hint in consideration and apply different optimizations, right? So just because, just because you can tell the database your system you read only doesn't necessarily mean it's going to do extra things to make your transactions run faster, right? That's left up to the implementation. All right, so any questions about uh, isolation levels or these access modes and things like that? We can do a quick demo and play around with this in, in SQL Server, or sorry, in, in MySQL and Postgres if you want. Okay, so. Let's do this. All right, so we're going to use the same, um, the same sample table that I had before from last class. Um, the Wi Fi connects. Good. All right, so this is Postgres. So we have that same, ta same table that has the, the two tuples. So what we'll do is we'll start a transaction uh, at the top, and that top transaction will be under um, serializable isolation, and we'll have this bottom one be under uh, read uncommitted. So this first guy will update the first duple, and just increase the value by one. The bottom guy will update the, uh, the second tuple and just increase the value of one. So this guy should be able to read the table now and see the change from the guy at the top. And he doesn't, right? Because the way Postgres actually implements concurrency control is, to, is actually using timestamps and everything. So they actually can't make read uncommitted happen because it would require them to do extra work. So you don't actually truly get read uncommitted. But now if I try to do that select here, this actually may stall. Let's see what happens. Now yeah, let me do it. All right? And so, yeah, now you only see your own update. But now if I go ahead and commit this, the top guy, now down below, now, now I can see it's change. All right? So, so this one, so in the bottom case here, I was running at read uncommitted. Uh, and when I did the select on the table when the top guy hasn't committed yet, I didn't actually see it. The top guy then commits. Now the bottom guy can see it, which is, that, which is what you get under read committed. Right? So let's try this same, the same demo in MySQL. All right, so same thing. I have uh, my table like that. All right, so in MySQL, I think you have to start the transaction and then set the, uh, the isolation level. All right, so this guy the down below, we'll start him. Reconnect it, that's fine. And then we'll set ourselves at read uncommitted. All right, so same thing. The top guy will then do update on the first people. The bottom guy does an update on the second tuple. Now, let's see. So before, again, when I ran this in Postgres, when I did the select on the bottom transaction, he didn't see the change from the top guy. So let's see what happens here. Doesn't see it either. So now I go to the top, do a select. He doesn't see it either, right? So now I'll commit this guy. You don't see it either there either. So now if I commit, then I finally see it. So it looks like, unless I'm doing it wrong, um, the my MySQL actually can't do uh, my SQL can't do uh, uh, read committed either, and no, that can't be right. So we're doing something wrong. Okay. So I'll start a new transaction. Say we're serializable. Update this. Start this guy at the bottom. Say we want to be uh, read uncommitted. And let's see whether we can read that now. Start from. 
There we go. Now I was able to read it. Why couldn't I do that before? That's fine. All right, so here. The bottom guy sees the right that the top guy did. Right? It sees, it sees 101. Right? So now if I roll back the, the top transaction and I come back here and now do my read again, right, now the value disappears. Right? So this is not, you, you know, you, you get this example of an unrepeatable read. Right? So my, so my, you know, this transact, this bottom uh, terminal here, you know, this is currently in a transaction, right? So we were running with serializable, well, we shouldn't be able to see that. We shouldn't see that the value flip, but in this case, we do. All right, so any questions about isolation levels? Yes. There's no way to like start a transaction and say like, I'm starting, I'm doing this transaction. I don't want any other transaction to be able to see it. His question is: Is there a way to start a transaction and say? I don't want anybody else to see what I'm doing. Yeah. yeah, so the way isolation level works is it's, it, it only specifies for your transaction. So you say, you, you're telling the data what you're allowed to see. Other people can still see your stuff. Right? You can't prevent them, okay. right? So, you, so actually, you could do that by, um, if you really want to do that, you could lock the entire table, right? So I think in, um, Right. So now here, if I go, so I lock the entire table in, in here, and I try to read from it, and it stalls. Right. So um, and again, it, it really specifies what what you what what your transaction is allowed to see. It doesn't affect what uh, other people can see. And eventually, this this will time out. I forget I, I forget what the, the default is in in, in my SQL. Um, let me show you also too uh, the how to start a transaction in like read only mode, right? So, um. oh, I forgot the syntax. What was the slide? Sorry. All right, let me actually show, let me show you also select for update too, because that's, that's kind of cool. Um. Right, yeah, so set transaction in, in read, write, read only. It's basically what will happen is the, the um, if I say begin transaction, As read only, and then now when I, if I try to do an update, it throws an error and says you can't do that because you're in read only mode. And again, whether the data system actually does a protect does a way for somebody to protect you, uh, it does optimizations based on whether your transaction is read only or not depends on the implementation. All right, so the last one I'll show you real quickly is uh, is the is the select for update. Because that's actually something is very useful in practice, um, and a lot of times I think you'll see that in real applications. All right, so we have we have two transactions now running in uh, serializable mode. So if I do tr start here, I can read that. Select start from that. They both can read this, but now if I do select star from transaction demo uh, for update, what should happen here? So both, both the top transaction and the bottom transaction are running a serializable isolation, and they both read from the table. So what do they acquire? Shared locks, right? And now we're doing select for update. This for update says I want an exclusive lock. So this let me do it in, in Postgres, because the way they do uh, uh, snaps to isolation in the control, it's a, you're allowed to read that because it's still consistent. But if I try this, the same thing in, uh, in my SQL, which I think I'm still holding this, this lock, so yeah, okay. So we'll start the first transaction at the top and the bottom in serializable isolation. The first guy will do a begin. 
select star from transaction demo. Second guy does the same query. They both can read it. Now he does a for update. And this should block. Yeah, so the, this one blocks. Right? So, and again, the, the reason I'm showing you Postgres and MySQL at the same time is because it just goes to show, even though I said I, I want both of these transactions in both systems running with serialized isolation, what that actually means and how it's actually implemented and what protections they provide uh, can vary wildly. Right? So there is a textbook definition of serializability, and there's different ways to implement them, and based on how you implement them, you, you get different behaviors. Okay. All right, so now the question that he had at the very beginning was, are we going to use two-phase locking on our indexes? And the answer is no. And the reason is because indexes are actually different than the, the, the actual data in our, or the tuples in our, in our tables, right? And the, at a high level, the way to think about this is that the, the logical contents of the index is the only thing that we care about. We don't actually care about the physical structure of, of the index, meaning if we read it, so what I mean by that is if I read it at one moment and I say, you know, is there a record where key equals Andy? And it comes back and says yes. And then some other transaction comes along and it modifies a bunch of stuff, but it doesn't touch that one key I read before. So I did splits, I did merges. The physical data structure now has changed. So now if I come back and say, do you have a, a record with key equals Andy? As long as I get back to the same answer I got the first time, I don't care how the index actually changed underneath the covers. Right? So the only thing we care about is protecting the, the logical contents which is what the index locking and all the other stuff I talked about before, right? The physical contents can change at any moment. But of course now, you know, as, as we saw when, we, when you implemented your hash table, you could have multiple threads trying to modify the physical data structure at the t same time. So we need, we need a smart way about protecting these things, right? And so the reason why you don't want to use two-phase locking, right? If you sort of think of it as, as, as your index as an abstract tree, I right? say a transaction wants to update node, a, node H, and transaction two wants to update node i, if the first transaction comes along and I use two-phase locking and I acquire all the locks as I'm going down, I can't release anything because as soon as I release one of these locks, now I'm in the shrinking phase of two-phase locking. And if I have to come back and probe this index again, I can't acquire new locks because that would be a violation of two-phase locking. So that means if I use two-phase locking on my index, I'm going to hold that lock for the entire you know, point of the transaction. And now I've acquired an exclusive lock on the root of the, of, the, of the index. So that means no other transaction can actually read this index. So it's essentially useless. Right? So the reason why we're not, we're not going to use two-phase locking to protect the physical data structure of our index is because it requires us to hold locks too long. So we need something better. We need something that's specifically designed for a, a, a B plus tree. Uh, and that's going to maximize the amount of concurrency that we have. So the technique we're going to use is called lock crabbing or latch crabbing. All right? And the basic idea is that uh, as we traverse the tree to find the thing that we're looking for, we're going to acquire locks on our way, on, or latches on, on our way down. Right? So this is what, you know, a good example where I intermix the word latch and lock. Right? And here, I'm, I really mean latch because it's, it's the low-level mutex. So we're going to acquire latches for, for our parents as we go down. Uh, for, you know, where we're starting point, and then before we go to the next node, we have to acquire the, the locker latch for that guy, and then we traverse down to that. Then we check now to see whether the, the, the node we're at is considered safe, and if so, we can then release the lock and latch above us at our parent, and then keep traversing down. And so by safe, I mean that we know that the node that we're looking at uh, will not split or merge. Right, because if you split, then you you know you have to take the node you're at, add another one, or you know potentially further down the tree, and then you may you, you will have to modify the parent to say here's a now pointer to the, the new thing I just split. Same thing for a merge. If I'm coalescing different different siblings, then I'm I have to update my parent and say you don't have two pointers now you just have one. Right. So once we know that at the current node we're at or in our level in the tree, we're not going to do a split and merge. 
then we can go ahead and release any, any locks that we've taken above us. Right? And the reason why it's called crabbing is sort of like, think of like a, it's like a crab walking, right? You're taking locks and latches as you go down that way. Right? I realize my hand gestures are probably not uh, helping illustrate this, but I'll, I'll show some examples. All right, so for searches, again, you start at the root, and then you take a shared lock on the parent, and then if, it, then if you know, you know, it's read only, once you get to the, to the child, you can go ahead and release the shared lock, and then keep going down that way. In the insert and deletes, you always have to check Take, take exclusive locks on your way down, and then once you have at a, once you have the lock on your child, you check to see if that's safe, and if so, you can release all the locks that you have above you. So I'm going to go through a bunch of examples and hope this will illustrate it. All right, so here's our really simple B plus tree, um, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to label these uh, the nodes with actual letter labels so that we we can understand what, what we're dealing with when we go down. And so in our first example, what we want to do is we want to search for the key 38. So under lock crabbing, uh, lock crabbing, we acquire the shared lock at the, at the root on A. Then we acquire the shared lock on B. And at this point, we know it's safe to release A, the lock on A, because it's a, it's a read-only operation. It's a search. So we're never going to modify anything. So as long as we get to our, our child, we can go ahead and release the lock on, on the guy above us. Right? Then we keep going down and do the same thing, just keep keep grabbing, inquiring, and, 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 and traversing. Then we get to the bottom, and then we, we can read the record that we were looking for. Yes, in the back. What do you mean by pairwise? His statement is, it's essentially a pairwise comparison at each level. What do you mean by pairwise? I'm not sure what you're saying. I'm, I'm missing what you're saying. Sorry. Like, so. Start at the very beginning. I always have to get the shared lock on the root, right? I get that. Then, I, then I, now it's safe for me to check what keys I have in the page and figure out what, what direction I want to go. So now I know I need to go to B. So while I still hold A, I get the shared lock on B. Once I land there, then it's safe for me to release, release the lock on A, right? Because right? the thing is, if you did it a different way, if, if, I, if I said, all right, I need to go, if I'm at A here, and I know I need to go to B. If I release A and then now jump to B, someone may have modified A at the moment, you know, it's a race condition, the modified A at the moment I jump, jump to B, and now that pointer that I had before is going to go to nowhere. Right? We're really talking like microseconds here, but it's still a race condition. It still could happen. So we have to be careful. Yes? Uh, so why you search 13? Well, finally comes to D, right? So, when you touch D, then you uh, first release D or first release C. So, so, I'm at this point here. I'm at B, right? I can release A. Yes. Now, I can acquire the latch on, lock on C. I jump down to C. Now, it's safe for me to release the lock on B. Yes. Your question was what? Sorry. Uh, I, I was thinking about C and D. So, so I, get, I get here. Uh -huh. Same thing. I have to acquire the lock on D first then traverse there, then it's safe for me to release the lock on C. Uh, so you release C first, then release D. Correct, yes. Yeah, so, uh, yeah, you, so again, this is a, sort of a reoccurring theme. You want to make sure you release and acquire locks always in the same direction. So we're going to acquire locks on our way down, and we, 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 we release them behind us, right? And that avoids any deadlocks. Because there's no, nobody could have a lock at a leaf node and try to acquire a lock to above us, because the only way they could get to us, to the leaf node, would be traverse down and take, take our latches or locks as we go. So it's always in one direction, so there's no deadlocks. All right, let's do a uh, delete now. We're going to say we're delete 38. So here we'll acquire the exclusive lock on A. Uh, then we jump down to B, right, and get exclusive lock on B. And now at this point, because we know that we, if we deleted an entry of, from B, that we would actually end up having to do a merge or coalesce with somebody else, right? Because we don't know what's going to happen below us. We may actually then you know, do a merging all the way up the tree. And if we deleted the entry from B, then we'd have to merge B as well. So B is considered unsafe at this point. So we can't release the lock on B because we may have to modify A. 
So then when I jump down to C, now at this point, C is, will be over half full. So if I delete an entry from C, then I know I, it, it can absorb that without having to do a merge. So we don't need to modify anything above us. So now it's safe for us to release the latches or locks on, on A and B. All right? Then we get down to the bottom. All right? We get to D. D, again, has, is more than half full. So if, we're gonna, if we delete entry from it, uh, we'll be fine. So we can release the latch on C. And then we can actually then apply our, our delete. Yes? So, that, so that, that was this point here. So at, when you're at B, right, if below us in the tree we have to do a merge because we're doing a delete, if we have to delete something and that delete percolates up to B where we'd want to delete the entry from B, then B would be less than half full. So this is going to have to merge. And when you merge, you have to update your parent to say, you know, here's the pointer to, to the, the right thing you should be looking at now. So at this point at, at B, it doesn't know what's going to happen below because we haven't got there yet. So at B, we may, if someone below us has to merge, we'll have to merge, which means we have to update our parents. So at this point at B, we can't release on A. And only when we, get, when we get down to C do we see that, all right, well, if I do delete something below me in the tree, I'll still be more than half full. So I'm not going to modify C and have to merge it. So therefore, I can go ahead and release the latches on, or locks on, on A and B. Yes? So when we get to D, we would also release the lock latch on C. Correct, yes. And then, so what if at this point, then like this, like it's like switched out, and then someone calls up and delete 44? So, anyway, so, so, this, this is blown away, right? So now someone else comes along and wants to delete 44, yeah. right? That would still be fine because you could delete this, you could delete node E, and I and D would still be half full. Uh, and then you, you delete a key from, from, from C, and that still would be half full, so you wouldn't, you wouldn't have to merge all the way up. Okay. Well, let's do an insert. Same thing, exclusive lock on A. Uh, keep going down to B. And at this point here, we know that if we have to split below us, B has enough room to handle that, so we can go ahead and release the latch or lock on, on A. Keep crabbing on our way down. We get to the bottom, uh, and we have enough room for E, so we don't. We can go ahead and release the lock on B and C, and then we can do apply or insert into there. Right? Again, it's just basically checking to see whether it's safe. And safe means that if I'm doing delete, will I still be half full? If I have to, if I have to merge below me, uh, and if I'm doing an insert, will I still be? You know, so, oh, I still have to have enough room if a new key gets put into me. OK? So let's do now a, a more complicated insert, 25. Same thing, exclusive lock on our way down. And we, and we do crabbing, so we release them as we go. We get to this guy here. We can release B, because we have enough room. But now we want to insert into H. Uh, but this is not going to be, this is not going to have enough room for us. So at this point, we still have to hold the lock on F, because we know that we're, we're going to do a split. And there's going to be a new key written into F. And so we need to make sure that we have exclusive lock on that, prevent anybody else from modifying it or reading it at the same time we're doing this. Right? So we'll go ahead and make our uh, new entry uh, for, for, for the key we're trying to insert or key, the key that we're merging out from the split. Um, and at this point, we still hold the exclusive lock on F. So nobody can find our new page yet. So it doesn't matter that maybe we haven't updated the pointer exactly to exactly where we want to go yet, because, or, or it doesn't matter whether we, we put the key 31 in F first or we make the page first, right? Because no one else can be able to see this, so everything will be fine. So now at this point, we can go ahead and release, release all our latches, and our, our, our insert operation is done. In the back, yes? How would we go about doing bulk inserts? This question is, how would you go about doing bulk inserts? Uh, So I'm not going to cover this, but things get tricky when you want to start doing things that go across siblings, right? And the way you typically handle that is you, you just, when you, go, when, you, when you need to jump to the next sibling, you just do another traversal and take the same thing down, right? 
Because the issue is, again, if, if we start scanning along the leaf nodes, I may acquire a, you know, a latch or a lock for these guys down here, but I didn't come all the way down to get there. So somebody else could be coming down and do something else as well. So a lot of times you'll see is you just, to, to bulk insert is sort of the same thing as a range scan, like you're updating a lot of things and they'll span multiple pages. Uh, you just have to traverse down and, and do one after another, right? Typically bulk inserts, as far as I know, it's not like I can take a 20 keys and, and inject them all at once. Each key will be a separate insert, right? Bulk inserts are typically done when you want to rebuild the entire index, and that one you have exclusive access while you do this. So you, you don't do this crabbing thing. All right, so an obvious question is, what's the first thing I did in all my examples that I showed you? For the insert, the update, and deletes, and the searches, what's the very first thing I always did? Lock the root, exactly, right? And in, the case, in this case, for the modifications, I'm taking an exclusive lock. So that means that for a brief window, this thing is basically done, you know, it's a serial data structure, meaning nobody else can do anything while we're, do, you know, why we hold this lock on the root. And depending on the operation, the layout of the tree, I may have to hold that lock for the entire duration of the operation because I, I don't know whether I'll be splitting and merging down below. Right? So this is locking the root every single time is always going to become a, bi a big bottleneck uh, in a lot of environments, a lot of applications, when you're updating your indexes and inserting new entries all the time. So a better locking algorithm uh, that came out of the 1970s from this paper um, from these German guys, Bayer and Schlockneck, is that what we're going to do is whenever we want to do a modification, an insert or a delete, that we're going to assume that the leaf node will be safe, meaning it's not going to have to split and it's not going to have to merge. And so We'll take shared locks all the way down, and except when we get to the leaf node, then we'll take an exclusive lock. And then once we figure out, when, we, when we're down there, is our leaf node actually safe? If it is, then we're fine. Could we go ahead and do our operation? We don't, we're not going to have to do a split or merge. But if we get it wrong, then we just restart the operation and take the exclusive locks that we normally would. All right, so let's do delete 38 again. right? So now I'll get a share lock on A, whereas before I got an exclusive lock, and I'll do my normal crabbing where I can release my locks as I go down, right? And then when I get to C, I'll go ahead and try to acquire the exclusive lock on D, then check to see whether I, uh, I'm still safe. If yes, then I can, I, can, uh, I can do my operation without ever having to you know, take exclusive locks on the way down. Right? So this is an optimistic uh, protocol or algorithm where you assume that uh, splits and mergers are rare, which in practice a lot of cases that's actually a safe assumption, and therefore you take shared locks all the way down and you don't have to lock the root every single time. Yes? So when you redo the uh, traversal, you have release all the locks. Okay, so his question is if, um, I think the next example will do that, right? So his question is if I do crabbing all the way down, and I get to this one here, and I'm doing an insert, so I know I'm going to have to split. So now, uh, you know, this node is not safe. I'm going to release any latches that I have, or locks that I have, and just restart from the very top, so right? So his question is, if there's another transaction, say there was an insert, I don't know, 24. Right? We're trying to insert uh, 25 or something. Um, if they're here at F with a shared lock, and they're blocked waiting to acquire our exclusive lock, we do our check, uh, and we save with the restart, and then we restart, but in between that time, they actually then can modify it because it's their turn to go do it. Right? Your question is, is that OK? Right, again, remember what I said before. I don't care about the physical data structure. I only care about the logical contents at a higher level in like two-phase locking and concurrent control. The index locking sort of covers that, right? So I don't care if somebody else inserted something to my page and that page that I thought was there before is no longer there because something else happened when I came back the second time. I don't care, right? And that's sort of the, the beauty of this. And again, another exa example why you don't need, you know, why you don't want two-phase locking because that really strong protection is not necessary for this. All right? Okay, cool. 
Right? So again, at a high level, the, the, way, the way this works is that the search is the same. Insert and delete is basically doing the, the, the share locks all the way down, except, and then when you get to the leaf, then you, you get the exclusive lock. Um, if everything's fine, you, you're finished your operation and you're done. If not, then you oh, restart the operations from the beginning and take exclusive locks on the way down. Right? And again, the idea here is that we're making this big assumption that most of the times we're not going to be unsafe. So therefore, taking share locks and, and maximizing the, the amount of parallelism in our system or uh, in our index is a better, is a, is a good idea. And the, the cost of having to restart in the case where we're not safe is so minimal compared to the, the benefit we get from the increased parallelism. Yes? Zero to the depth, basically anything you could stop at the second node and be like, okay, I'm probably deep enough down the tree, I can just start grabbing exclusive blocks because not, not many people will be grabbing that. Yes, yeah, so his statement is that instead of only having to acquire the exclusive lock at the, at the very at leaf node, you could take exclusive locks as you get closer to it. Yeah, basically you can make it tunable, like sure. three level deep down the roof or something. Yeah, yeah, yes, you could do that, yes. <laughs> okay. All right, so again, the, the, the last, thing, last couple of things I want to stress are in the, the multigranular locks that we talked about before, you basically release them from the bottom up. And then for our, our latching here is that we release them from the top down as we go, and we're going to do this as soon as possible to maximize the, the amount of concurrency or parallelism we have in our system for other threads to do modifications, right? All right, so any questions about crabbing? Okay. And actually, I'll say a quick spoiler is that in the advanced class, we will cover lock-free data structure, lock-free indexes. Uh, right? This is sort of something that's in vogue in, in, in the case of systems. Um, and in practice, at least in our experiments, we have found that actually the lock-free data structures don't work as well as, as crabbing. So even though this idea is from the 1970s, it actually still is, is state-of-the-art. Still, still actually works the best. Okay. So... Uh, indexes make concurrency control a bit more tricky because it's this thing where it's not exactly the, you know, the primary copy of, of the data and other transactions can read it, but we don't want to use two-phase locking to protect it in the same way that we protect our tuples and our tables, right? Um, and building a concurrent index is actually tricky and is important to, to maximize the amount of parallelism you can have because that's in a lot of cases in O2 applications, they're going to most, the transactions are going to spend most of their time doing their index lookups. Right? So if you have an efficient index that, that is high performance, you can, that'll make a big improvement. For OLAP queries, it doesn't matter as much because you're just doing large table scans anyway. And then most applications uh, do not execute with serializable isolation, uh, even though, again, the textbook and everything and, and a lot of academic papers make this big assumption that, of course, this is exactly how you, how you want to run your things. So I will say, though, I think, although serializable isolation is probably too strong for most applications, uh, the lower isolation levels are actually, that actually provide some guarantees or protections is actually what you want. Right? If you just run sort of a NoSQL system without any notion of transactions at all, uh, or even like eventual consistency in other things, when we talk about distributed systems, the amount of time your application programmer is going to have to spend to have to reason about what is actually the correct state of the data that I'm actually trying to read is, is actually becomes problematic. And if you go read the Google Spanner paper from a few years ago, they had this opening paragraph that says, we thought we were all big about NoSQL and eventual consistency and no transaction support, but it turns out all our programmers were spending their time trying to reason about all the anomalies that can occur in their data um, and became very, very, you know, sort of expensive from a labor cost. And so they found it's actually better to have a data system support stronger transactional semantics and have a, a small cabal of really smart people how to figure out how to make those transactions run really fast and provide that for everyone else. Um, from, sort of, from their sort of organizational standpoint, that was a better decision. So, Serializable actually may, may be too strong for most things, but some protections or some transaction support is, I think is important in your database system. Okay? Any questions? Okay, so next class, 
even more concurrency control because I love it so much, right? Uh, we're at, now going to talk about a, a variant, or sorry, a, a different class of concurrency control called uh, timestamp ordering. Remember, I said a few uh, last week that there's basically two categories of concurrency control. There's the pessimistic and the optimistic, right? It's two-phase locking or timestamp ordering. These are the only two categories that, that that you can have. And then after that, we'll discuss multi-versioning, which is sort of a um, a another way to organize your database and run transactions that actually will use either timestamp ordering or two-phase locking. So when a system says they do, they do MVCC, they're still going to be doing either two-phase locking or timestamp ordering, right? So we'll, 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 we'll go through that and understand how that works, okay? All right, guys, awesome. Thank you so much. See you on, on Monday.